Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 14th episode of the Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie in France, joined also in France with my other co-host and best friend also in France, Michael Hamilton in France. <laughs> best friend and best friend in France and in France. Crazy. Yeah. How are you doing today, Roger? In France? In France. How are you doing? Bien. That's good in French, too. Oui. Look at you. You're a regular coin of sewer. Uh-huh. I know very little French, but I'm getting by all right, especially with help from my buddy Roger. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I at least use the French menus when we're at Three Brasseur. Mm-hmm. It's a nice restaurant, and they have English menus for people like me who do not know any French. I don't know French either, but I can still use the French menus using my wits and my cunning. Cool. I know. <laughs> so today is the day before the Pro Tour. We're getting ready for a lovely banquet this evening that we're going to sit down with James White and share a nice meal and tell him all the wonderful ways that we love his game and appreciate Flesh and Blood. Mm-hmm. We're going to be at the same table as him, and he's going to tell us how much he loves our podcast and how he listens to every single one so far. Um, I'm sure that's exactly what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, uh, what are we going to talk about for the next 30 minutes? Or so, uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about our decks for the Pro Tour. We aren't going to air this until after the Constructed Round start, so... At that point, yeah, yeah. Sure we'll this live. way, when we sit down in front of our opponents and we say, hey, I'm playing Dash, they won't say, oh, I knew you were playing Dash on your Manor podcast already. And that's why I teched all of my destroy item sideboard cards. <laughs> Are the destroy item sideboard cards even good against Dash? We're definitely not playing Dash. They destroy items and the Dash plays items, right? She sure does. So they have to be good. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, Michael, why are you playing Viscerai? I'm not playing Viscerai. I played, I played so much Viscerai yesterday practicing I, for the event. But you're I'm a not playing, master. I'm not playing Viscerai in the event. I am playing, to the surprise of everyone, I'm sure, all time. Okay. I've heard this from a wise man on the internet. First, you have to answer the question, what is old time doing better than Bravo? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, throwing a little bit of shade, but uh, old time has a lot of things going from over Bravo. He has a very powerful hero ability. Unlike Bravo, where you can pay Bravo's ability, you pay two resources to give your attack dominate. Not a very good rate. It's two not. points. That's two thirds of a card for zero damage and harder to block when most characters don't want to block anyway. So uh, it's fine. It's got its spots that's good, but overall, not a very powerful hero ability. Old Time's ability to pitch an ice card to put a card from your opponent's hand back on top of their deck is very powerful because a lot of the more aggressive heroes. Uh, their damage scales exponentially with the amount of cards they play. So if they're playing a three-card hand, their damage is usually less than three-fourths the amount of damage that they would get from playing a four-card hand. Okay. Additionally, you get Winner's Will, which is one of the best weapons in the game. Probably slightly behind Rosetta Thorn, but there's not a lot of other weapons I'd put above it. But it doesn't swing for six. Yes. It only swings for four. It's two less damage. It is two less damage, but it threatens an on-hit, which very few weapons in the game do. Um, a Frostbite can really mess with turns, and... One card for four damage isn't a bad rate. Yeah, but it's not two for six. I mean, if you want two for six, you can play Sledge. But the advantage of playing Winter's Whale is you also get to use a shield. And there are two very good shields in the game right now. Both Stalagmite and Rampart of the Ram's Head are extremely powerful. And Bravo can play Rampart if he uses Titan's Fist, but Titan's Fist is really bad. <laughs> uh, so you get access to two really powerful shields that are good in different spots and... It's obviously matchup dependent which shield you play, but they're both in my list, and um, they're both very powerful. Uh, on top of that, you also get Oakenold, which is probably not better than Crippling Crush, but it's very comparable. It has built-in Dominate. It only costs three resources and uh, has a very similar impact on its hit trigger because... Two cards. They lose two random cards, as, uh, as you love. I do love random discard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Randomly putting on the bottom random discard is pretty close to the same thing. Same thing, yeah. Second cycle. I mean, old time games reach second cycle a lot of the time, but a lot of the time you're Oaken Olding in the second cycle, and then now their cards are set up for third cycle. Yeah. Which, that's not happening. They're just going to die. And I can't believe you didn't mention Crown of Seeds to help you get the second cycle, that Bravo doesn't get to play Crown of Seeds to get the second cycle. Yeah, I mean, Crown of Seeds is very powerful. Um, Some say it should be banned. It's too I powerful. would not agree with that, but... You know, I also am one very biased. resource for one life? It's broken. That's that's, that's at rate. Cards usually block for three. That's a card is worth three resources. That's three life for three. So 
The, the fact that you can filter your arsenal, though, and you never have to worry about, like, if you end your turn with an extra blue, you can stick that blue in arsenal and don't have to worry about it getting stuck there. That is pretty powerful. And additionally, in combination with both Rampart of the Ram's Head and Null Rune equipment, Crota Seeds also efficiently lets you pitch cards on their turn to prevent damage. So a common play pattern is Visceri will attack you, and over the course of their turn, they're going to deal 4 arcane damage or 5 arcane damage. And normally... If you want to prevent all that arcane damage, you have to pitch two cards. It's really hard to use that extra, that extra resource that you have left over. But Crown of Seeds and also Rampart make that a lot easier to uh, completely to spend the resources from those two cards fully defensive. Okay. So once you're playing into Viscerai, how are you going to beat Viscerai up? Okay. Uh, so that matchup is one that we've tested a lot because expecting we're expecting a lot of Viscerai at the Pro Tour. And that's why I played a lot of Viscerai yesterday is to make sure my teammates got their practicing against the deck got their plans all sorted out know what kind of cards they want in the matchup <laughs> and um against mr I basically the plan is you're gonna swing winners well at him a lot he really doesn't like frostbites because most common or his ideal hand is some kind of mauvern skies into one of his two cost attacks in the swing or set of thorn and one frostbite really messes that turn up and then on top of that like i was saying earlier about ice react we have that to interfere with Revel turns and Swarming Gloomvale turns when they're following up something else, then they get Ice Reacted and don't get to play that card for what is usually worth 5 damage and even more on Mordor Tide turns. So, a combination of Winter's Will and Ice React, and then a lot of times Viscerai takes off turns to set up, and we have a lot of the big Guardian attacks to try to punish that, basically. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. What's your plan into Prism? No, that, that's, that, that's not happening. If I play a Prism, my plan is to, uh, so in the next 20 minutes... In a game that I know I'm not going to win, and then probably go get food because the game won pretty fast. It will? The games usually take a while. Yeah, like 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to play Prism. Thanks for asking, Michael. I didn't know if you were done asking <laughs> about my deck. You do this every time. You're like, ask me questions about my thing. And I'm like, are we done Are we done talking about this? Are we done? I'll ask you how you're doing. If you're like, yeah, that sounds like a really cool deck or something. And it sounds like you got your plans worked out. I'll be like, yeah, thanks. So what are you playing at the Pro Tour, Roger? I plan on playing Prism. Your not best matchup. <laughs> uh-huh. And that's because for everybody not named Michael Hamilton, I've been about 500 into Viscerai on Prism still. I think there's a lot of... I, I've been saying this quite commonly, where Prism gives opponents a lot of rope to hang themselves with, where she's just a deck that maximizes punishment when opponents misevaluate an aura or a turn cycle or they stumble at all. She's very capable of just even punishing her very bad matchups and just completely taking over the game from there. And additionally, there's a lot of ways to play around the poppers that exist for the deck. Most people are just thinking like, oh, I need to play a million poppers in the matchup. I just need to bring in all these command and conquers and all these array spaces and all my million poppers. And it's pretty easy to tell in the first few turn cycles whether or not they're on the max popper plan or they're just on the more dynamic handling or a plan with cards like Lead the Charge. Some decks play both, but usually it's hard to maximize both a lot of poppers and a lot of Lead the Charges without sacrificing some kind of deck quality and consistency. And once you evaluate which plan is better, that's kind of what you're trying to maximize on charge cycles. And I've been finding that against the Viscerize that over-prepare for Heralds by bringing in cards like Command and Conquer or Erase Space, like I just said, just jamming a lot of auras is a plan that they can really struggle into. Since those aren't cards, they're naturally super happy to play, and they're not Rune Blade cards, obviously. So they're not getting maximum efficiency out of the turn cycle. And when they're not on as many poppers, then you're just trying to race as efficiently as pop possible with cards like Wartune Herald, Mirage, and Metamorph, and your very efficient Heralds, while still maintaining auras here or there, and using... Arc Light Sentinel sometimes to steal tempo in either game situation. So that's why I feel comfortable in Prism's quote, worst matchup, unquote, into Viscerai. And there's just so many decks, as Michael is alluding to on old time, in the field still that just are, well, this deck would be insane, but Prism exists, like Icelander or Kano or Dorinthia. There's just a lot of decks that simply can't handle the game plan that Prism establishes. And 
even into her bad matchups. Like I said, there's just a lot of room for our opponents to make mistakes and still hate you the victor today. Makes sense. For the record, I wouldn't say Dorinthia would be insane if Prison didn't exist. I think she'd be very good. I think she'd be a solid tier 2 deck, especially okay. in an aggro deck. Okay, I don't play a lot of aggro decks, so <laughs> outside my wheelhouse. Yeah, I think she would still heavily struggle into old time, but I think aside from that, she seems like a solid choice. Okay. I, I might play Dorinthia. If only those two living legend points actually went through, I might be on Dorinthia this weekend. I don't think, unless they banned her during the Stubby Hammers announcement thing, it wouldn't have mattered if she gained the two points, right? Because it wasn't a scheduled ban, it was a surprise ban. But they could have done it during the Stubby Hammers emergency ban. They could announce it tonight at the dinner and say, LOL, sorry if you bought Prism, she's banned for the Pro Tour. That would be horrible. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. No. I brought some backup decks, I'd still be okay. I'd be pretty happy with my old time choice if yeah. that happened, though. <laughs> I just whip out the old time deck I brought and call it a day. Yeah. Maybe they'll surprise ban something else, though, at the dinner tonight. Announce Yorick's legal. Uh, class Constructed tournament. Yeah, I'd play Yorick and Class Constructed. Just put in the 60 Cracked Bobbles in Yorick, play a game of Flexion Play. Can you register Cracked Bobble in a Constructed event? I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. I heard it was a token, and you can't put a token in your deck. But I guess Phoenix Land is also a token, so that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I was about to say, why can't you put tokens in your deck? Okay, I'm mm-hmm. sure you can. Yeah. You can play Crack Bobble. Eventually, there's this rumor card that where it's like supposed to be James White's favorite card, where if your deck has nothing but Crack Bobbles in it, you win the game. I've heard whispers of such a card. I don't think that's a thing. That's probably not a thing, but I've heard it from the same people who told me that Muse underneath the truck is really like, How would you even cycle your deck if it was all Crack Bobble? All you can do is like swing your weapon every Well, you can arsenal a Crack Bobble and then pitch your crack, crown of seeds. Crack, crack bobble. So you make your crown of seeds or your crack bobbles block for one and then you use your other resource for the crack bobble to block with Rampart of the Ram's Head and then you move on to your turn and you pitch two crack bobbles to your whatever weapon you sledge. Sledge. Yeah. Two crack bobbles to sledge them. And then you play the game until eventually you hit your I win the game crack bobble card. Okay. Easy. Yeah. I'm sure that'll be a thing. Mm-hmm. So the... Pro Tour Banquet is tonight. There's going to be... No, let's go back. Let's go back. We haven't finished talking about your matchups. Okay. So you talked about your matchup into Viscerai, and obviously you have a lot of like very good matchups for Prism. Mm-hmm. What about the other aggro decks, like Briar, Dash, and Phi? Uh, Phi, I just plan on going even lighter on the Auras and just trying to race as efficiently as possible with Heralds. Phi's not a... Or, yeah, Phi's not a deck that naturally plays a lot of poppers, and once again, is a deck that like is very clunky into them. And the more I play with Prism, the more I find this really interesting play pattern where, as you were alluding to it on Old Hive, there are a lot of decks that scale exponentially with the damage in their hands. And oftentimes, people will just say, look at their hand on being attacked with a Herald and just pop it. They just they don't put a lot of thought into it. It's almost like an auto response, like, oh, I get to do the thing, I'm gonna do the thing. Mm-hmm. And Definitely so that happened to me a couple of times yesterday. <laughs> and as Prism, you're usually pretty happy to see that. It sounds kind of counterintuitive because you want your attack to hit, that's why you're playing with it. But since you're not the beatdown, I'm quoting in air quotes that nobody can see right now, you're still trading a card for a card that's dealing six plus damage so it's almost like you're using your heralds as these very efficient block cards in that case to scale down the damage that your opponent's going to be presenting to you in the next turn cycle in order to either set up an aura or once again block efficiently and then swing another herald so that's why i struggled into mike over the past few days is he kind of picked up on that play pattern especially once i explained it to him and he stopped popping my heralds a lot of the time and so i would even just be hitting with herald of protection getting my spectral shield so my seven points of damage for two resources he would just look at his hand go okay and present back uh runic reclamation or very efficient amplify the arc knights in viscerai and swing back way more damage than my hand then wasn't able to block as efficiently because i wasn't able to use a herald to effectively block for six damage so that's what i was alluding to this whole time as well with Prism gives opponents a lot of opportunity to hang themselves with, or a lot of rope to hang themselves with, because if people don't pick up on what I'm actually trying to accomplish with the Heralds, it's very easy for me to convert them into defensive resources, into offensive resources, so people aren't evaluating their hands inappropriately. So you're telling me when you play a blue Wartoon Herald, you're not like, please let me get this five damage through. Yeah. (laughs) 
I'm, I'm in the one card and soul. I just, I just need it more so than anything when I'm down 10 life. <laughs> and so I think into Briar, I think I could get that to do above 500. And that's because Arclight Sentinel is a much more efficient and better card into Briar than it is against Viserai. Why is that? Well, when you Arclight Sentinel into Viserai, he's able to still generate a handful of rune chants and just kind of float you know, three, four, five, sometimes even six damage in rune chance between the turn cycles. And so you're stopping whatever normal attack they're playing that turn, but you're not actually mitigating that much damage with it. Whereas against Briar, the best she can do usually is create one rune chant with grasp. And then if she's lucky, creates an embodiment of lightning. And given that her deck is built around having go again pretty naturally anyways, for most turn cycles, that's not that big of a deal. So if you're able to line up your Arclight Sentinels and time them very well into Briar, especially when you out heroic turns, it's pretty easy for Prism to set up winning game states from there. And then additionally, she actually plays less poppers than Viscerai on average, so she needs to rely on the more clunky cards like Command and Conquer or Erase Face that aren't necessarily a part of her natural game plan and can really kind of lead to really clunky and awkward hands for her sometimes. So I'm not saying it's like wildly amazing. I just think that that matchup is more skill intensive and not as bad as anybody really gives it credit. That makes sense. And I guess the main difference in pop is the lack of Amplify the Arc Knight and Briar. Yeah, Amplify the Arc Knight is a big thing. And she can play Runic Reclamation, but I think it's just a bit of a clunkier card for her sometimes. Yeah, Nimbleism doesn't combo into Runic Reclamation as well as Modern Skies does. <laughs> yeah, or sometimes they're playing cards like Lightning Press, and then you draw your Lightning Press, Runic Reclamation, <laughs> and you're like, huh. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, and then everything else I'm just kind of agnostic about, where I feel like I'm 50% or better. And then Dash, I guess the other best talk about Dash, this recent upcoming, after she won Singapore. Yeah. So what do you, how do you feel about your Dash matchup? So, I know the dash game plan into Oldheim is, like, you block out a lot, you set up your weapons. Unfortunately, I have not actually gotten to play into dash very much leading up into this event. It's one of the matchups that I feel quite unprepared for. I think before the matchup was, like, reasonably in dash's favor, but it wasn't... It's not nearly as bad as Prism. I don't know if anything could be as bad as Prism, where you're just, like, their Prism, you sit down, and you're dead. Mm -hmm. But I think dash is definitely... Solid in the old time, and it will probably be a challenging matchup. But hopefully, with the big guardian attacks I was talking about earlier, it'll just be enough to get through. And we also have Rampart, so even when Dash sets up the super strong three, four, six item end game, you can still mitigate a lot of damage fairly efficiently with Rampart. So part of Dash's power is you look at the numbers, and if she has two induction chambers and a plasma purifier, it's two blues is nine damage. But against old time. He can prevent, or sorry, two, yeah, two blues is nine damage. And against Oldheim, I didn't think about this math for a second, sorry. You know, the first attack's three damage, you give it go again. Then the second attack's three damage, you give it go again. And then you don't have any more chambers on, or any yeah. more. So two induction chambers, so you load two induction chambers, one plasma purifier, it's and the gun damage. three times. Yeah, it's eight damage, because you want to have a counter on purifier. Purifier lasts the whole turn. Oh, the whole turn? Yeah. It's, okay. So it's know. once per turn, but it lasts the whole turn. So I, I'm also you, unprepared for dash, evidently, as well. <laughs> so um, because you have to break the chain to reload the pistol each time, Rampart quite efficiently blocks it because it gets reset. So a single blue will block six damage over three attacks because the first time you block with it, it's worth one, the second time it's worth two, then the third time it's worth three. So dash really needs to get the two or even three plasma purifiers before she really has that strong late game setup against old time and the induction chambers look a lot worse when rampart is just scaling its block against them so well dash's end game is quite scary where she has several items in play and old time isn't great at killing her before she reaches that point especially with her defense reactions i don't think it's hopeless that makes sense prism gets a kind of similar thing with phantasmal footsteps being able to block efficiently across multiple pistol attacks it doesn't scale as well as Rampart, obviously, because you just get the one block consistently across the attacks. You don't get to go plus one every time you mm -hmm. block with it. But it's still very efficient at blocking, so that's why blocking a 10-power attack with it is probably not something you want to be doing in the matchup. And so that kind of gives you a lot of play. So if they come into you with a pistol game plan, I think it's fairly reasonable to try to play with Heralds 
and trying to set up auras here and there since they won't be necessarily as prepared to deal with auras if they're not having as many. Actually, let me rephrase that. I think if they're on the pistol game plan, it's it's better to rely more on auras since they won't be boosting as much in order to get their action points back or presenting much damage to your face on a turn cycle. And it'll make it harder for them to potentially pop two auras in a turn. And then if they're just trying to aggro you out, I think it's perfectly reasonable to just once again block as efficiently as you can and then come back in with heralds. They do play a good number of poppers, but not a lot. I think maybe like six to eight. And once again, it's one of those situations where if they're blocking with their poppers, then I've just saved that cycle of uh, damage or whatever that card is worth, where they're needing a lot of resources to attack me with cards to begin with. And I guess a lot of resources from deck, because boost obviously burns so many cards through their deck. It'll make me more inclined to play the longer fatigue game and then get to a game state at the end where my auras can take over when they're using Mopi-ish pistol attack. <laughs> If a dash opponent brings Talishar to the match, do you think you have a reasonable chance of fatiguing them? Is that a thing they do? Yeah, the the, the boost dashes play Talishar. Why? Because it's more efficient than pistol. It's two for four, and the games don't go long. Hmm. That's interesting. I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I'm not expecting a lot of dash at the same time. Maybe we'll both head back on our face and dash will win the pro tour now, too. But I'm not a huge believer in dash, even after she won a call it. Uh, I think... Michael knows. I think he has one of the worst hero abilities in the game. It's just not a real hero ability, starting with an item. Or six damage. That's just, like, not a real hero ability. I think it's one of the worst ones in the game, just on power level. Just because mm-hmm. outside of the first turn cycle, it does literal nothing. I think a lot of hero powers are worth less than six damage. I think there are a lot of bad hero powers. Sure, but you said one of the worst in the game. Yeah. Like, if you're not, like, one of the top five, you're the worst, you're one of the worst. <laughs> okay, I think your scale is a di- little bit different than mine. Yeah, there's like five playable heroes and everybody else is garbage tier. We all know. So everyone else is one of the worst in the game. I shouldn't say garbage tier. I'm sure whatever hero you like that <laughs> isn't in the... T- no, sorry. Your favorite hero is definitely in my top five. I'm not going to go into which ones are or are not garbage tier. But Azalea. No, her hero ability is real good. She gets to do things to her. She, can let her, she, can, she has crowd seeds, right? Yeah. It's real got good. a card on the bottom. got a new card off the top. It's broken. She's very good. As she was in one of my top five considerations for this pro tour. You did talk about her a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, so that's kind of our expectations. If there was like a rogue dark horse deck that you think could do well at the pro tour, what do you think that would be? That's tough. I don't know if Isolator's still a rogue after she won the battle hardened. And Old Heim's definitely not rogue. I would like to put money on Old Heim, though. I think he'll do well. That's surprising given that you're playing Old Mm-hmm. <laughs> um... Maybe Lexi. I'm still a Lexi believer. I think Lexi has a lot of tools against the aggro decks, and the new set gave her some tools against the control decks with the Insidious Chill. Um, and I've always thought Lightning Lexi was also better than people give her credit for. Her Viscerate matchup might be tough because it's hard to block Mauvern Skies, but she can put out a lot of disruption, and Viscerai is not great at blocking either. Makes sense. What about you? I would say probably Dorinthia. She's once again one of those heroes that gives opponents a lot of room to make mistakes and misevaluating turn cycles and while we're thinking that the meta is more aggressively slanted overall she's very punishing to the decks that aren't inclined to block she has a lot of block on her armor naturally in order to soak up damage and she's just able to still set up game states where dawnblade now just takes over the game if decks aren't prepared for knowing the matchup well and naturally not wanting to block anyways. So I could see you're putting up some solid results if the meta in her matchups shake out the right way. That makes sense. So let's talk about draft. Oh okay. yeah, there's a draft portion of this Pro Tour. We got isn't six there? rounds of draft coming oh, up. Oh, I blocked it out of my memory. <laughs> I was just so prepared for classic construct and now I'm like, oh yeah, I have to draft five. So, <laughs> so on Tuesday, we got to play a couple of drafts with Yanji and Michael Fang's group. They were there. They were, they were hosting the drafts. Yeah, they were there. Yeah. Who else was there? Uh, there was Ethan Van Sant. There was Bodhi. Brody, oh, right? Brody. Yeah, I'm Bodhi. He was Brody. Brody. <laughs> oh, why'd you put me on the spot like this? Who I was referring there? to the Oh, the Arsenal pod. Pass group was there. That's who it was. <laughs> yes, yes. What are their names again? 
Hendon, uh, Patrick, and Dayton <laughs> Pale, with right? Brendan Patrick, Hayden Dale, and Sasha Markovich was also there. Oh, yeah, those are their names. Those yeah. guys. I remember them now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How'd they do in the draft? How do we all do in the draft? What was, what was up in the draft? What was the draft like? You tell them. You tell them what the draft was like. Well, first, we opened packs of cards, and we looked at them, and then we took one card out of the pack. And then we passed it to the left. That is how drafting works, yes. And then we took the pack that was passed to us, and we picked it up, and we looked at it, and then we took another card out of it, and then we put it down, and then we passed that pack to the left, and then we picked up the card, or the pack that was passed to us from our left again, and then there were 11 cards in it, 12 cards in it, and... Yeah, because you start with 14. Yeah, you start with 14 in this format. I already picked two cards. Mm -hmm. 14 minus 2 is 5, and then we... Pick a card and we put it face down and pass it to our. What left. happens next? And then we pick up a pack and we look at it and then we take a card and put it down and pass it to the left. This is what you wanted me to explain when you told me to pack on the draft. <laughs> and then we repeated that for three booster packs. And at the end, I had an Icelander deck. You had a Dromai deck, and we played against each other round one, and you beat me up because In classic that's just, fashion. That's just what happened. Or just playing round one, not me beating you up. That's just what happens, and then I went on to win my next two matches, and you 3 0 the whole pod. You beat everybody up. Well, I beat the three people I played up. Yeah. Yeah. Look at you. Ready to crush. You're ready for the Pro Tour. I'd love to start my Pro Tour 3 0. That would be very nice. You'd be one of the highest-ranked limited ELO players of all time now. The K-Factor, for, I, we, we keep talking about this, but the K-Factor for our the limited rounds of this Pro Tour is insane, actually. Yeah, we were talking about Worlds qualifications, and I have a PTI that... I'm hoping I don't have to use for Worlds, but I might, because Top 50 Constructed and Top 50 Limited, I am currently in both, but that could very easily change this weekend. Yeah, I'm right on the bubble there. I'm currently 60 in Limited for my one good result in Cincinnati that one time <laughs> a year ago now, but I don't think I'm going to go to Worlds regardless, so it really doesn't matter where I rank. You you definitely wouldn't go to Worlds. It's in San Jose. Why don't you like San Jose? It's so far away. I'm in France right now. I don't want to go to San Jose. I'm away from my child and my wife and the things I like, and I don't like being on airplanes. It's, just, it's too much. It's too far. San Jose is a lot closer than France. Though, yeah, but it's still far. It is. They should have put it in like Columbus, Ohio. Everybody wants to go to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> That's got North Market. Yeah, I think there's a battle heart in Columbus, Ohio next, next week. Unfortunately, I'm not looking for I I don't even know if I'll go to that. Really? I'll probably go to it. It's only like a two and a half hour drive, so morning of. But like, I've been gone for so long now. Like, I don't. Th I don't know if you know this, but I've been away from my family since Sunday. That's crazy. Yeah. How are, how are you holding up? I'm hanging in there. We have, we finally got over jet lag. It was nice, like being able to sleep at the nighttime and then wake up in the morning time. That was a unique experience so far in France. Yeah, it took three days or so, but we we did it. Yeah. Shout out to all the people who are flying in. Tonight, Thursday, before the event, they're like, yeah, we're just going to show up at like 1 p.m. on Thursday and go to the dinner and then be at the Pro Tour the next morning. And I'm like, how is that possible? I'm just going to be so sleepy. Yeah. I'm an old man. I need my sleepy. I'm, I'm glad we came early and had some days to adjust. That's, if you are, are able to, that's definitely something I would recommend. Yeah. France is a cool country, state, <laughs> whatever it is. You know. Yeah, France is a cool They speak a lot of French here, though. They do. They also speak like... More English than I expected. Yeah, everybody likes English. It's, oh. it's required. We're the American English center of the world. A lot of people speak a little bit of English, and some people speak reasonably more than a little bit, and it's made it much easier to communicate than I was maybe worried about at times. Google Translate helps. I've That's... done a lot of just pointing my phrase that I want into Google Translating and then pointing to my phone like a caveman. Ah, oh, this, this. And they look at my phone and I go, ah, oh, s'il vous plaît. So jumping back to draft, <laughs> you said you are looking forward to, or not looking forward to drafting Phi. Yeah. You might not draft Phi. You could I end up drafting Phi or Icelander. That one time yesterday, and it wasn't a mistake for the first time in my life. And there were two Icelanders in the pod, and you correctly went to Icelander. Yeah. Both Icelanders went Michael to Michael Fang made me. You don't understand. He just kept passing me Icelander cards. He's like, you go to Icelander, please. And I was like, okay, Michael Fang, if you insist. <laughs> and then I was an Icelander. That's and then the next draft pod, he was two seats away from me, and I looked at my pack two, or, yeah, pick two, pack one, and I realized there was a Dromai card missing, and I was like, oh, guess I'm not going Dromai, 
and then I started going into Phi, and then there was another drill my card missing, and it's like, I'm really not going into drill my now, and I passed, and then I wound up in Phi, and it's this great Phi deck. Yeah, two draw I passed in me, right? Yeah. It was Icelander. It was actually drill my Icelander, drill my, drill my into me. That's a good spot to be Phi. That was a good spot to be Phi. I won my first round. I beat Michael Hamilton up, and then yeah, that was sad. I lost the Phi mirror in the second round. But I Did you win or lose the die roll? I actually won the die roll. Oh. It was. And then I spent a long time talking about whether or not it's ever right to play three Phoenix Flame in your Phi deck. And I think on the draw, it might not be, regardless of how many cards you have, just because I leaked so much damage in my opening hand because I drew a Phoenix Flame. And that's what ultimately cost me the game, just leaking that Phi damage on turn zero. Yeah, that is a lot of damage to leak. And so it was a good lesson to learn. And I don't think I'll ever play three Phoenix Flame on the draw again. On the play, I think it might be okay, just because leading with it and being able to tutor it up if you have cards like Flame Scale Awakening, Flame Call Awakening, Flame Call Awakening, uh, in order to get more value out of it. But on the draw, I'm less sold on it now. It's also really nice when you're going first to just like have that second Phoenix Flame in your opening hand, since you're if you're not gonna like damage, just like playing it and getting it in your graveyard so that you can end your turn by arsenaling one Phoenix Slam and still having another Phoenix Slam in your graveyard, or you can keep all of your cards that care about having a Phoenix Slam in the graveyard turned on. Yeah, Burnaway is a card that I'm very high on that I think a lot of people might not be at this point, but a 0 for 4 go against opening up a combat chain when you have an excess Phoenix Slam in graveyard is a very strong card, especially it since it blocks. Yeah. And even when you don't have it, it's a, it, because it's a, two, it's a 2 with power attack, so you get to use... Tide scale flippers in order to get to go again that way. Tide flippers. Tide flip. Tide scale flippers. Flame scale. Flame <laughs> scale flippers. Scales, huh? Yeah, they're, they're, they're dragons. They're scaly. <laughs> Those are the draw my cards. We're talking about five cards right now. They're still scaly. the phoenixes are scaly. Oh, that's true. That's true. It's just draconic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you feel about draft? Uh, I'm pretty nervous going into it. It was a pretty big confidence boost to three zero, like a pretty tough draft pod, and it was just practice. But I was really nervous and re feel, really feeling underprepared for limited going into this and i think i was happy that i was able to move into dromai and the four people passing to me were all not dromai so some luck there some reading signals combination of both um and i'm hoping to do that again at the pro tour hoping to do something similar where i find the open seat but sometimes it's easier said than done i wonder if they're gonna be stamped cards called shout out to stampies i know they're gonna be like sleeved or like paxed account for the double-sided dragony dudes, but I don't know if they're going to also factor in people potentially trying to sneak in their own cards of the pro team. Yeah, I, I really don't know if they do that, because like even in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati, right, the limited calling, <laughs> the top eight wasn't stamped, but they watched us pretty closely. But yeah, I guess, like, but doing that across a whole event at something as high as a pro tour, like, in a Format right. where like just like saying like oh yeah I totally pack one pick one a sash of Sandakai or like here's my foil sash of Sandakai that I own is a pretty big like cheat edge. It's obviously not something that we would do, but it's something that I think other people could potentially do, and it's something that I'm non-zero to mount. Yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully they will have stamp cards or have a system in place to prevent that kind of thing from happening. Yeah, I'm less worried about it with like legendaries. Just because I don't, it makes sense to like if you're trying to like cheat like this, like putting in something that's as flashy as that, and there's such a high risk of like there being two legendaries in your pod that you just couldn't account for. And yeah, something innocuous like adding a red rising resentment or a sash of Santa Kai. I think sash of Santa Kai or uh, or one of your key equipment pieces. Yeah, it would be pretty easy to slip in and just be, turn like if you if you open like a spellfire cloak and just you're like oh I didn't have a spellfire cloak I had a sash of Santa Kai. It's something that I'm kind of worried about and I hope makes sense. As far as the actual cards in deck, I'm not super worried about it because there's not. I guess Necria. If you're if you're already a drama, if you just slip in your own like if you just turn like even like your Azalai into a Necria or something like that. Sure. Get your Uvia out of here. Well, you want Uvia against Iceland. Oh, uh, Necria against Iceland. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I guess we'll see. It's something that I also liked in Magic because then you got to show off your cool stampy cards when you play your LGS. You're like, why do you have a kitty cat stamp on your? Remand, and you're like, well, let me tell you about how good I was. I day two to GP, and I got the stamp card. <laughs> I'm a very good player, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I kitty cat remand your spell now. Okay. I still have my kitty cat. I believe that. My most prized possession. Oh, 
leave it to my son as an as inheritance one day. And they'll remember me fondly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anything, any final thoughts about the Pro Tour before we wrap things up? Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> I'm thinking. I am really like, I'm really excited for the Pro Tour and I'm nervous and have doubts about my deck. I just died of Prism. Could I have other bad matchups too. It's not just Prism. But I think Dromai is kind of tough. I think Ice Lander is kind of tough. Mm-hmm. And I don't think any of the aggro decks are buys. I think I am slightly favored, but, you know, it could just end up not working out, you know. So I'm nervous, but I'm very excited and really grateful for the opportunity to come and compete with all the best Flush and Mud players in the world. And Roger Bowden. You're included. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you're here. You qualified. Did I? You won a pro quest. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> uh you got Prism 4 Living Legend points, and you got first slice of the ProQuest. I guess I did. I guess mm-hmm. that's a true story. That did happen. Mm-hmm. So, and I also really appreciate that um, Legend Story Studio is holding these kind of competitions, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but that's kind of what pushed us away from Magic, because they stopped having a lot of tournaments and stuff, and the fact that there is another great game that has these great tournaments that I compete in, I really appreciate that. That's good. Yeah, any closing thoughts for you? I'm just glad I'm not jetlagged anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm honestly not nervous or excited for the Pro Tour. If that, it sounds weird to say that. I'm just kind of taking things moment to moment since I've been here. And almost for like this whole two week period, I just really haven't thought about sitting down for my draft or whatever or how I'm going to perform over the weekend. It's not honestly something that's I, something I'm super worried about. And I can't really put my finger on why exactly. I think I have a lot of stuff going on in my personal life that's not necessarily distracting me from the game, but stuff that I'm also very focused on, you know, professionally and personally. And you're buying a house. Yeah. And I'm just so much less tied up in the results of these things than I used to. So I think that's just a healthier mental state to have where I guess I'll be upset if I don't do well in the Pro Tour or whatever, but I won't be super upset. It's just... I. I'm just happy that I'm here more so than anything. This was kind of like a dream that I had back in Magic was just making it. To, so it's just nice to finally get to whatever the highest pinnacle of competition is, regardless of my results once you're there. It's just nice to actually be here and be in a foreign country competing at something. And whatever happens, happens. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Anything else before we sign off? Ready to, ready to wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. I apologize for any audio inconsistencies or anything like that we're recording this from our hotel room while there's construction outside and our cheap travel microphone may not sound the best but we're doing our best but next time you're playing flesh and blood always remember mind your manners